buttons, you know which way to turn them, left or right. All right, let me mention this very quickly, uh, Brother Robert. Uh, I didn't give him the announcement and, uh, about the fact of uh, Brother Randy Mayer and his family will be here on the 3rd of this next month, and he'll be preaching that Sunday morning. And of course, they'll be presenting music for us on Sunday morning as well as Sunday evening. They'll be using our facilities here to uh, get ready for their summer uh, tour of uh, vacation Bible schools that they do during the summer, and uh, we uh, a privilege to be able to have them with us and for him to pick our facility and uh, to work out and uh, train his people from uh, Bob Jones University to work with him for the summer. But uh, we're glad to be able to have them and I trust there'll be a blessing and I say that that uh, you'll be inviting your friends and uh, getting those that do not go to church anywhere and encourage them to come be with us on that Sunday morning and I know they'll truly be blessed. Years ago man by the name of Dr. Jack Howes. How many of you have heard of his name? Okay, Dr. Jack Howes, on several occasions, I heard him make this statement, and I'm, I'll try to quote him verbatim, but he says, uh, be kind to everybody because everybody is having a hard time or a bad time. And that's true. Everybody has hard times in their life. Well, Peter comes back to kind of climax this thought in regards to bad times. He says, we're not finished with them. They're going to continue to come. And of course, he warns against false teachers and those who would come in and uh, bring false doctrine in among us. And so there's going to be hard times. You may have hard times at your work. You may have hard times, uh, you know, with your family, whatever it might be. But we all have hard times. And so we need to pray uh, for one another. But here in First Peter chapter number 4, I want you to look at verse number 12, down through uh, verse number 19. I'm not going to read all the verses, but uh, because I want to get over and uh, allude to another scripture in just a few minutes. But he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. It's, it's nothing strange. Now, I want you to jump over to the next chapter, and I want you to look down specifically at verse number 10 that tells us four things that happen when you and I uh, face the hard times, and we call those hard times uh, suffering. Uh, whatever the suffering may be. It could be physical suffering. It may be the suffering uh, financially. It might be suffering from, um, uh, from persecution, as many people are going through, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I want you to look at verse number 10. There's an element there. Are you listening? There's an element there that each one of us need as we face hard times. It's called the principle of grace. You're not only saved by grace, you're kept by grace, and you're helped by grace. You're propped up by the principle of grace. Grace is needed in every aspect of life. And by the way, when it comes to the time for you to pass from this life into the next, God will give you dying grace, so don't expect it until you get there, all right? Uh, don't worry about it. You know, a lot of people, they get really upset about dying. Uh, you don't have to worry about dying because God at that time will infuse into your life that matter of the grace to die with. So uh, don't worry about it. But there are four things that God says will come out of this matter of suffering and as he applies his grace to your life. Look at verse 10. He says, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have had suffered or you've had hard times a well make you number one perfect. Now think about that in just a minute. God is trying to do something in and through your life and my life to help us to be more Christ-like. And I'll hit a little bit more a little bit later and show you some very important principles. But God is trying to take and to conform us to his son, Jesus Christ. And that word perfect means uh, 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 to maturity. God wants us to grow up. And many times you and I do not grow up until we get out in, into the real world. I, I remember as I was literally shoved out, so to speak, when I went to college, I really found out what it was to work hard. I mean, really. I mean, when you carry 18 hours, uh, you know, in courses uh, to, uh, to get through college, that's a lot. Now, I know there's a lot more uh, people that take and take more classes than that, but that's a pretty heavy level. Matter of fact, most time, they would not let you take 12, but 12 uh, credit hours if you were working. Well, I took 18 credit hours, and I worked almost 40 hours a week. 
and uh, it was tough. I got about four hours sleep a night, and I made it. Uh, I may uh, it may have taken a little toll on me, but uh, I was able to get through. But uh, the the hard times, and I I really understood what my dad was talking about when he talked about uh, you know hard work. So there are hard times coming our way to mature us, and I feel like I grew up then. I feel like, man, I, I, I was plunged from 18 years of age into like 35 years of age, you know, because you have to grow up real quickly to take responsibility. And Peter says, look, hard times are beneficial to help you and I mature in the Lord, but they do something else. Look at the second thing very quickly in verse number 10. He says the second thing is not only to help you to perfect you or mature you, but to establish you. Uh, a lot of Christians today are not established in the faith. Uh, matter of fact, they're blown about with every wind of doctrine, everything that comes down the road. They're, they're kind of pulled aside from the Christian walk because they haven't been established, or we would call grounded in the principles of God's Word. But then Peter comes and he says, let me give you a third thing. He says the third thing is the strength in you. Uh, Heavy loads, heavy things strengthen us. Do you find that out, Brother Jess, uh, by the work that you're doing now? It, it, it begins to build, it puts strength into your life and the physical body. And God wants to strengthen you in your Christian faith. So uh, many times he'll permit this matter of hard times or suffering, problems, difficulties come to your life. Uh, it's not to break you, but it's to make you. And I don't know if you heard that statement before, but it's true. Then he said, let me give you a fourth thing very quickly to help you to see how important it is for hard times to come our way. And that is to settle you. You see, God wants to make you a person that's established, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, as Paul said there in the book of 1 Corinthians. So, hard times are a good thing. And they're going to come our way through the matter of the principle of suffering. Matter of fact, if you go back to the book of Job, we find there in chapter number 5, in verse 7, it says, Yet a man is born into trouble or suffering as the sparks fly upward. But Jesus knows all about those problems that you and I are going to go through. And he's preparing us for it. See, sometimes we have to go through the fire. Uh, anything that's really worthwhile. Have you, have, how many of you have maybe a valuable piece of pottery? If you have a, a good piece of pottery, it always has to go through the kiln. Okay? It has to go through there to make it uh, what it ought to be as far as bringing out its beauty, uh, making the, the strength of the pottery uh, more uh, 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 usable for you and me, and it purifies. So we need that in our lives uh, as well. We need that purification, so we have to go through the fire. Uh, can you imagine? If you think back there in Babylon, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And it wasn't just an ordinary, you know, a flame, but it was fired up how many times? Seven times, a matter of perfection. Because God wanted to do something through those three men's lives that ordinary Christians wouldn't have to go through, though we do have to suffer as Christians today. So if God has to turn up the furnace seven times, uh, God has a, a, a principle he's trying to apply to your life and my life. But God wants us to understand that. And then, of course, in 1 Peter chapter 5, we look there. Sometimes we forget about the principle of taking and casting our care upon the Lord. Casting all your care upon him. Why? That's when we learn that he cares for us. That's when we really see the constant abiding grace that God wants to apply to our lives. Now, if you would, look back at verse number thir uh, 12 again. It says, Beloved, think of not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer. In other words, he's saying, look up here if you would. He's saying, look, don't bring this thing on yourself because of your neglect, or because of your long, wrong type of living, or, uh, you know, that uh, you are not doing what's right. He says, don't let those matters come into your life as a thief, or an evil doer, so forth, as a busy body, and other man's matters. Yet, if any man suffers, they what? Say that word. Christian. All right, now what is a Christian? Come on, what is a Christian tonight? All right, someone who is Christ-like. All right? Now, how can you be Christ-like if you don't go through the same things that he went through? And one of those things was the principle of suffering. Now look back if you would. He says there's a principle that comes out of this. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be what? Ashamed. Now I'm going to say something about that in a little bit when I get into my actual uh, message. And I want you to keep that in mind. But let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it be, first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? For if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore... I'll, I'll, because of all that's just happened. Remember this principle. You've heard it before, but let me recall it to your mind. Whenever you see the word wherefore or see the word therefore, look back at the previous verses and see why it's therefore. There's a purpose why God says certain things in Scripture. And so he says, look, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the what? will of God. Now, here's the key in your life and my life in regards to this matter of suffering. If you're in the will of God, you have nothing to worry about. Amen? I mean, the suffering is there for a purpose. Now, if you're not in the will of God, then that suffering may be because of something you did. And Paul, uh, Peter has just said that previously in the verses in verse 15. Then he goes on to say, uh, According to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Would you bow your heads and let's pray together. Now, my Father in heaven, I want to be a blessing tonight. I want to be an encouragement. I want to be of help to be an instrument to help uh, each person here to build their life and to grow strong in the Lord as we face the hard times and difficulties of life. And I pray tonight that I'll uh, be able to get the, the message across that Peter, uh, through the Holy Spirit, was trying to write to us about and to let us apply it to our lives that we would not uh, uh, become uh, lackadaisical in our Christian walk, uh, become cold and different. Lord, that we would be more like Jesus in all that we do and say. So I pray you would take your word tonight. Help my voice to be clear. Help me, Lord, to uh, be pleased in you. Help me to say everything I ought to say and leave unsaid those things I shouldn't say that I'll glorify you tonight through this message. May you speak to each one of us and draw us closer to you. And we'll thank you for it. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text is very important because of some things that God wants to do in your life and wants to do in my life. You see... We're all in the rebuilding room, so to speak. We're all uh, clay in the Lord's hands. And he's trying to form us. He's trying to make us a vessel fit for the master's use. And so Peter comes to verses 12 through 13. And the very first things he says to us, and I hope you'll get this down. You'll write down. Take notes. Uh, might help you in regards to your life. Peter says, let me give you something that would be beneficial. The first thing is the coming of hard times can do something vital for your life and my life, and that is this. God wants to develop some character in your life that's not there. God wants to develop something in your, your, your being that he can use you in a greater way. And so the first thing's there in verse 12 through 13, the developing of your character is vital if you're going to be the Christian God wants you to be. I want you to look back at those verses real quickly. You see, a Christian is to be conformed to the image of God's Son. And hard times is to develop a characteristic in your life that's vital for you to be able to be the person He wants you to be. If God doesn't do it, it's not going to be there. And He wants it in your life because you're not going to be beneficial if you don't have it. 
So he wants to have that part of your discipleship training to come in the fruition. God wants you to have the kind of character you have. Maybe you have a, a weak sense of character. And God wants to do something with your life. And what you're to say, Lord, I, I, I remember. How many of you remember uh, 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 Dr. Roloff, Lester Roloff? Raise your hand. And one day he says, uh, Lord, if it's going to make me a better Christian, turn up the heat. All right? If it's going to make me a better Christian, it's going to make me a better person to be able to better serve you, turn up the heat. And God has sometimes has to turn up the heat to develop our, the character he wants in our life. You see, one of those things is he uses suffering or problems, difficulties. Let me ask you a question. When you're thrown a curve in life, what, what do you do with it? Do you, do you just move out of the way or do you let it come to you? I mean, when a Mack truck comes full force against your life, what do you do? Uh, when something comes that you don't like in your life, do you say, Lord, what are you trying to develop in my life? What are you trying to do to help me to be more like Jesus Christ? So many of us do this. We avoid it. We move to the side. Rather than say, Lord, you take full control and do in my life that which needs to be done. You look back in Scripture. What was it that God was trying to do through David down there in the Valley of Elah? Come on, talk with me tonight. What do you think he was trying to do? He was getting ready for him to be the man of God that would be a great soldier. All right? He was to be a king. A king went out to war with his warriors. God was trying to develop him. Just a young boy, but he became a great warrior for the Lord and then became the king of Israel. But that started back there, actually on the hillside, when he was taken, he was fighting against uh, the lion and the bear. Uh, God was trying to develop his character. And then he says, well... There's enough of this bear and lion stuff. Let's take you up against the big stuff. And so he takes him down to the, the valley of Elah. And there he meets a giant. And uh, all the army of Israel is afraid of this fella. And God says, all right, now we're going to see what you're made of. Huh? God does the same thing to you and me. He takes us into the valley to build us, to make us strong. He wants to do something in your life or my life through the pressures of life, through the fires of life, through the adversities of life. God wants to take and develop you into the person you ought to be. You say, well, preacher, good night of life. I I'm up in years. God still wants to develop your life. God still has something he wants you to, to do in your life. I, I, honey, I remember Mrs. Turner. You remember Mrs. Turner that was in our church? I don't even know if she's living now. I kind of lost touch with her. But the last time I heard, she was 85 years of age, and she was still serving the Lord in programs of the church she was in. God, matter of fact, uh, last time we heard, she was talking to me because she wanted me to possibly uh, marry she and her next husband she had come up to. I think of Donna Lou uh, uh, Merrill and uh, the fact of what she's doing. She's still serving the Lord in a full force way. She's gotten remarried now and she's serving the Lord with the, her new husband up in years. But God's still using her, still developing her. And God wants to do that for you and me and he brings these things at us. You see, suffering and problems and hard times are not always invited by your life and my life. We really, we don't know what suffering really is all about, do we? I was reading this week about the sufferings in other countries. For example, in Pakistan, worshipers were attacked on a, in an Easter uh, Sunday morning service. And many had died. In Indonesia, a pastor uh, was taken and they still can't find him. Uh, in Bangladesh, Desh, uh, a lay pastor was beheaded. Think about that. Uh, in Iran, a pastor called before the Islamic court and who knows what's going to uh, take place in his life. In India, uh, Hindus attack a church while police take a, a lunch break. 
you know. And uh, in India, again, villagers beat Christians and burned down uh, their prayer hall. And so forth and so on. We go on and on there in regards to some things I was reading recently about what was happening in other countries. And folks, this isn't back in the dark ages. This is a nasty, in the nasty now and now that this has taken place. They're suffering. And we don't even really know what suffering is about, do we? We don't understand really what's transpiring in their lives like we ought to know. But look here at verse number 12. He uses a word that's very important for you and I to get. He says, Beloved, think it not what? Strange. Uh, don't, don't, be, don't, don't think it's an unusual thing that if something comes up on your life, if you begin to have a hard time or you have an opposition in your life, don't, be, don't take and be upset about it. Don't be uh, feeling that, uh, boy, poor me. Anybody there? Come on, raise your hand. Poor me. Come on, raise your hand. Everybody knows that. Uh, I, look what I'm going through. No, we're not going through half the things that the Lord went through or other Christians have gone through. You see, God wants us to understand we have something. It may be strange, but don't feel strange about it. It's going to happen, and we need to take it. So Chuck Swindoll made this statement. If we view life as a schoolroom and God is the instructor, it should come as no surprise when we encounter pop quizzes and periodic examinations. Maturity in the Christian life is measured by our ability to withstand the tests that come our way without them shaking our foundation or throw us into an emotional tailspin. And that's true. We shouldn't think it's strange that we get upset and we say, well, I'm just going to quit. I'm going to throw my hands up and I'm going to walk away. No. When we look at what Jesus did for us, why would we want to do that? But wait a minute. Look back there, if you would, at verse 14. Hard times build yours and my character. But wait a minute. As I began to study the scripture out, I began to try to scrutinize it by the Holy Spirit. And there was a second thing that came to my heart and mind as I looked in especially into verse 14. And that is, hard times bring us closer to God. Hard times are developed into our life to bring us closer to the Lord. I mean, when I was a little kid, maybe you did the same thing. When the kids down the street wanted to beat me up, you know where I ran? I ran home, all right? I ran to one of my big brothers, all right, because they could help me out. Yeah, I, by the way, I'm the smallest one in our family of nine, all right? And uh, there were 12, the other three skipped out, all right? Anyway, uh, it, it draws us closer to God. Hard times are to help us to depend upon the Lord more, trust Him more, and look to Him more. That's what God wants us to do. But look there, if you would, in verse 13 and 14. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be what? Say the next word with me. Glad. You say, well, I'm, I don't, I'm not too glad about something coming my way. You are when it will push you closer to the Lord. When it helps you to know his nearness. You see... Are you listening? James says, draw near to God, and he'll do what? He'll draw near to you. God sometimes has to give us that little extra push through a hard time to get us closer to him. God wants us to understand that. And so there in uh, verse number 13, he uses two words. Uh, he says, glad, and the second word he uses is the word rejoicing. God says, look, I want you to be able to rejoice. Then in verse 14, he uses another word, the word happy. So he, he uses the word glad, he uses the word rejoice, and he uses the word happy. You see, when you get around Jesus, that will make you happy, amen? You see, God wants us to rejoice. How often? Well, take your Bible and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4, would you please? Philippians chapter 4, and if you look down there in uh, verse number 4, I want you to read it out loud with me. All right, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, let's read together. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. 
You see, God wants us to rejoice. And sometimes we forget about the hard times that gets us closer to the Lord. And we see his face, we see his situation, and we begin to rejoice. We begin to be happy. We begin to be glad. We need to do that. But I thought about three words that God brings into our life when we have suffering. Number one, participation. You know, there's a lot of Christians are sitting on the sidelines, aren't they? They don't want to participate. I don't know about you. I, I have a hard time. Brother Chris, I have a hard time when I'm sitting out in the congregation. I'm a preacher. And somebody else is preaching. I said, man, I like to be up there preaching. I mean, I'd preach at the drop of the hat, and I'd drop the hat. You see, God wants us to participate. If you're not particip participating, uh, the other night, uh, uh, other day, uh, I, I rejoiced in the fact of three people getting saved. I mean, it was like, man, I said, Lord, I, I want to be submissive. I went to see a family uh, to help them in regards to some things they're going through. And I said, Lord, I, I'm, you know, I love visiting people. I really do. And uh, so I said, but I want to do more than just visit somebody that I know is saved. I want to go and visit somebody that's not saved. And the Lord says, why don't you start knocking on doors? I said, okay, I'll do it. You know, it's just like this morning I talked about being sensitive to the Lord. And I says, all right, you show me the doors to knock on. And uh, the first door I went to, guess what? Nobody home. And I could have just said, well, I guess I'm not going to find anybody home. It was, it was get, beginning to move towards the evening hours. And, you know, people, you know, they're, they're settled in and so forth like that. And unless it's somebody you want to definitely go and see, then uh, sometimes they just don't want you to be there. And so I said, nope, I'm not going to give up. So I went on down the road and the Lord says, turn in. You know, man, I'm glad there wasn't anybody behind me. You know, uh, couldn't give a turn signal real quick. He said, turn in. Went in there, met this young man. Now, I have the opportunity to go on back this next week and talk to him this morning. But this young man got saved. Now, what if I hadn't been sensitive to the Lord? I said, I didn't have my, I had my loafers on. I wanted to kick them off. You know, you know I, I, I wanted to have a hillbilly shouting fit, you know. But I rejoice in the fact of seeing somebody. And then I went on down the road there. And the Lord had already put in mind the house on the way back that I wanted to visit. And I stopped in there. And I led a mother and her son, a grandson, to the Lord. I mean, you, you should have seen this little kid. I mean, his name's Andrew. And uh, I mean, he was excited. I mean, when he was even praying, he was, he, he was, he, he was just rejoicing in the fact that somebody told him about Jesus. And I hope we'll be able to see them come and be obedient to the Lord in baptism. But uh, you and I, God gives us the opportunity of participation. And the participation, in this case, is we share in the sufferings of Christ. And Peter knew about that. He understood about it. You know, Peter, uh, he kind of snuck out, uh, so to speak, from uh, the sufferings that night when he denied the Lord. By the way, we'll talk about that in just a few seconds, about being ashamed. And he wrote about here because he was ashamed after that whole ordeal when he denied the Lord. And he had the opportunity to participate in winning those people to Christ, but he wasn't a testimony to them. You see, uh, are you listening tonight? If you are, say amen. amen. All right. Sometimes God puts us into unusual situations to help us to be effective in reaching maybe somebody else for the glory of God. And I, I've often wondered... That night as Peter, Peter uh, sat around uh, with, uh, and warmed himself at the fire, if he would have said, you know, uh, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me talk to you about Jesus. Has anyone ever taken the Bible and showed you how you can know you go to heaven? Folks, people need to know the Lord. Come on. And it's our opportunity to participate. And we really suffer loss when we don't because we don't have that opportunity of picking that fruit for the glory of God and being able to reach people. But you and I have the opportunity to participate in his sufferings. Secondly, the second word is the impartation. 
we experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our life, uh, you and I are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But there's more than just being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It's being filled with the Spirit. Uh, did you realize this? And maybe some of you understand it. When it says be filled with the Spirit, it actually means be ye being filled with the Spirit on a continuous basis. God wants you and I to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about this. God lives within you and me. And we have the great opportunity of Him using us firsthand when we let the Holy Spirit take full control. Uh, years ago, when Dale fell, Faisenfeld and the Life Action Group, how many of you ever heard of the Life Action Group uh, out of Buchanan, Michigan? Uh, Dale and his group came to, we were the third church in Fayette, Indiana that they came to. And we had a great revival. We had 125 people saved that week. 125 people saved that week. I mean, our church was busting at the seams. I should say burst, huh? Be correct. But God wanted to do something. And God did do something that week. And the Holy Spirit took full control. And we learned a little uh, song like this. Send the great revival in my soul. Send the great revival in my soul. Let the Holy Spirit take complete control. And send the great revival in my soul. We need that today, amen? God can do it if we'll let the Holy Spirit take control of our lives. But there's a third thing, and that's exaltation. That is, we rejoice when we see the fact of what Christ is doing in and through our lives. But until we have the hard times, we're not drawn closer to the Lord so we can be effectively used of Him in every way possible. Um, let me use this illustration very quickly, and I'm going to get you out on time. Don't worry about it. Don't look at your watches. Don't look at your calendars, all right? Anyway, we are right here. All right, now picture this. Here we are. And Christ is over here. And Christ wants to get us from there to here. But there's one thing majorly that will get us from there to here. And it's called suffering. Here's the problem. We're here, and most Christians will end up about here. They don't end up over here. But when we begin to suffer and let Christ work through us, the hard times that we're going through, the problems, the difficulties, when God wants to draw us closer to himself, he wants to move us over here. He wants us to walk with him and talk with him and let him tell us we are his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. You see, Adam and Eve knew what it was to walk with him and talk with him. Abraham knew what it was to walk and talk with him. He wants the same thing for you and me. Can you hear amen? Amen. God wants that for your life and my life. So hard times will not only take and get us to the place of the character that God wants us to be. I know some of you are characters already, but I mean, God wants you to have that Christ-like character. And he wants us to be drawn closer to him. But there's something else. Would you look there at 1 Peter again? God wants to do something. And that is hard times will lead us to serious self-examination. Hard times should bring you to this. Lord, is there something in my life you're trying to correct? Is there something that you're trying to get me to get rid of that I'm dependent upon rather than dependent upon you? You see, that's what hard times is to take and get you and I to begin to say, uh, boy, I need to take an inventory. Years ago, when I was a clothing salesman, every year we did an inventory to make sure that we had what we needed. And uh, we'd, we'd take a whole week, you know, to do inventory. We'd shut, off, uh, shut the, the doors at a certain time, and we did an inventory. Because it was important for us to see where we were in our materials that we had in our stores, 
and we had three stores and we need to make sure everything was right on beat as far as our finances and so forth and so on. That is true in the spiritual realm. What is our spiritual temperature of our lives? And God says, look, it's important for you to examine yourself. That, that, that's what uh, we find there, Paul, when he talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when we come together with the, uh, for the Lord's Supper, we're to examine ourselves to make sure every, everything's all right. Amen? We need to examine ourselves. Matter of fact, another place it says, examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Not to call, you know, cause you to have trouble as far as uh, doubting the Lord, but just examining yourself. I'm glad God brought me to an examination. And many of you have heard this before, but for those of heaven, when I was 12 years old, I thought I, I, thought I was a Christian. I, I went to church, I went through all the motions, I read my Bible and all, all the various other things. But when I was 15 years old, I came to realize I was a lost, hell-bound sinner, and I needed to be saved. And I got saved. But I had to examine myself. You know, what, what, was, it, uh, what, what was it that I was, you know, empty of? Uh, what was the problem? And God wants us to examine ourselves, see, if we're doing what God wants us to do, if we're the person God wants us to be. Look there at verse number 15 through 18. But let none of you suffer as a murmur, murderer, as a thief, or as a evildoer, as a busybody in other man's matters. In other words, he says, uh, do an examination of yourself. See if you're being what you ought to be. Uh, are you the wrong type of person? Are, are you letting sin come into your life? Are you becoming a, a person that's going to be a, a bad testimony because of the things that you do, the things that you say, and the things that you choose? God says, do an examination. But he says a little bit first, verse 16. Yet if a man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed. You see, that hit Peter right between the eyes. When the Lord said, I want you to write it down, he says, Lord, I'm ashamed of what I did. I really I blew it. I mean, that night, I, I, I could have been a testimony for you. I, I could have been a, a, a vibrant uh, individual to help people to come to know Christ. But I wasn't. I was ashamed of you. I denied you. And many times, the things that we do in our life, we bring shame upon the Lord. And, of course, shame upon ourselves. And the word sh shame means something very important here in the Greek text. And that is... It means to dishonor. Let me ask you a question tonight. Is there anything in your life that is dishonoring God in your daily life, in your choices, your actions, your ways? Are you dishonoring the Lord? Look back, if you would, there at the Scripture. Let me give you something else very quickly, and I'm going to close here for just a minute. Look down at verse number 19. Hard times teach us to trust God in new ways. Hard times teaches you and I, a great teacher, to trust God in new ways. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, a new dependence upon him. A new dependence upon him. I mean, think about this. Maybe you've never won somebody to Christ and you'd like to be able to go talk to somebody about the Lord. Well, that might be a new experience or a new dependence upon the Lord that you're going to depend on Him. I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I had uh, the opportunity of being with uh, 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 several of the, of the greatest soul winners in time past. They're in heaven now. But how many of you remember Dr. J.O. Grooms? Anybody in here in, in auditorium? Uh, he was with the sword for a long time. And went about, and I think he was with Jerry Falwell, and then I, I don't know if he was with Jack Howes or not. But Dr. G.O. Grooms, I had the opportunity of going out and uh, was soul winning with him. And I've never seen a man quote so much scripture in all my life. And the impression he had upon my life, and he says, listen, give them the word of God. Let people be convicted by the word of God. Let the word of God change their life. I mean, I, I, that guy, I mean, for one solid hour, he'd, uh, you know, quote Scripture, and he'd show the Scripture in the Bible. But uh, 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 having a new dependence upon the Lord to help you to learn Scripture and to witness to people about Christ. You say, preacher, I, I can't talk to people about the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Is there anything too hard for God to do? Yes or no? 
Can he make you a soul winner? Can he help you to teach the Sunday school class? Can he help you to be obedient to him in every area of your life? Surely he can. And so we learn that new communication as well. That new dependence upon him. A new commitment. Look there at verse number 19. Wherefore let, him, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit. That's not too much in the Christian realm today. Commitment isn't thought about. Uh, it, it's like this. When you and I get involved, we're making a commitment. I, I, I've talked to people often uh, about this matter of committing themselves to the Lord. Getting involved and being faithful in the things of God. And so Peter says here, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. You see, we need to hear everything Peter says in the scripture and let him apply it, let the Lord, I should say, apply it to our lives. Will it be the matter of uh, uh, believing God? Will it be the matter of obeying God? Uh, will it be the matter of a new dependency upon God? Will it be the fact of letting him take and build character in your life? And I'll not go back through the message. But God says, look. Once you commit yourselves unto God because He knows best. Uh, can I hear an amen on that? Amen. Do you really believe that tonight? God knows what's best for you? Uh, remember when it says, Father knows best? Our Father knows best. Amen? amen? Commit yourself to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the opportunity to present Your Word tonight. Thank you for the teaching here in 1 Peter chapter 4 that you give us in why suffering or hard times and problems and difficulties, when they come, to our, come our way like a Mack truck coming at us, we can stand up and we can know that you're in control and you're going to take care of the situation. And Father, we pray tonight that every person here will get a grip on the fact and ask you what is needed in their individual lives. Maybe we need to be drawn nearer to you. Maybe we need to have uh, uh, our character built. Maybe we need to yield to the will of God and commit to serving you in some capacity that you give us. And uh, passing out tracts, being a soul winner, inviting people, get involved in, uh, in the ministry of the word in a more uh, prominent way. I pray that you would touch each one of us here tonight. And Lord, may we go away from this place after the service uh, with a greater desire to serve you and to live for you and be the person you'd have us to be. I pray you would touch each person here tonight. I don't know how you're going to deal with each person, but I pray that whatever is individually needed in their life. Maybe some need to come to the altar and just pray tonight. Some uh, may need to come and say, Lord, I want to be obedient to you. Whatever the case might be that you're speaking and, uh, to each person, I pray that we will yield to you that you're trying to accomplish in our individual lives. May thy will be done this invitation, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with